British television broadcaster and naturalist Sir David Attenborough has completed his latest series, The Private Life of Plants. The series attracted over 8 million viewers when it first aired on the BBC in January. Since then, millions more have tuned in to watch plants devouring mice, seducing bees, and invading territories with the determination of an army. It will air in the United States on October 9th on TBS. And I am pleased to have Sir David Attenborough here with us this evening. Welcome. Thank you. Are, is your family, do you know of any other family in England that has two brothers who are, have been knighted? Come to mind, anybody? <laughs> um, Sir Richard and Sir David. Yes. I, I don't no, know. I know nothing comes to mind. You know, no, yeah. that, that, that's yeah. the sort of thing that keeps coming to my mind. Yeah. Sort of thing. Um, tell me about this series and why, why you, and, and what you have discovered about the world of plants. And I'm sure that somebody at the BBC must have said, uh, wildlife is one thing, plants is something else. That's, that's quite right. I mean, when, when I went and said, I've got this terrific idea, how about uh, an hour-long program at PCARS about leaves? <laughs> <laughs> they, said, they said, oh, um, he's out of his mind. Yeah. And what would you like to do for the encore? Paint <laughs> drying. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, being serious, um, I've been making natural history films for 40 years. Yeah. Uh, and we're extraordinarily egocentric. And yeah. uh, as animals, we're extraordinarily sort of animal-centric. We always look at everything from, from the animal's point of view. And the plain fact is that the plants are, from many ways, much more successful organisms than, than animals. I mean, they grow bigger than the bigger plants than any, any animal. They live longer than any animal does. Mm. Uh, they can transcend time. They can travel through time with a, just by this extraordinary device of a seed, mm -hmm. which will last for a hundred years, which we yeah. can't do. Yeah. And above all, they are the basis of life. I mean, without plants, no animal can exist because there's nothing to eat. Um, and I thought. And when you come to think of it, of course, plants use animals. I mean, we are the servants of plants in many ways. I mean, when you or I pick a blackberry, we tend to think how bountiful nature is to provide us with blackberries to eat. You know? But of course, the blackberry is a device, a, a, a rather cheap device at that, by which the blackberry plant manages to get its seeds transported for two or three or four miles because we eat it and we swallow it and the seed comes out a long way away. Um, and it was devised, I mean, it was, devised, it was evolved for that purpose. Mm -hmm. you know, one mustn't say that evolution has a purpose in mind because we know it doesn't. But the strategy was there. Anyway, I suddenly thought, why don't we do a series of programs from the plant's point of view, in which plants are not the victims but the heroes. And, of course, nobody else has done it before. Why has nobody else has done it before? Because uh, plants do anything, as you, said, as you yeah. said. But, of course, that is because plants live on a different time scale than we do. And if you can change the time scale, if we can move onto the plant's time scale, then suddenly you would see these things are murderers and uh, territorially aggressive yeah. and, and shy and uh, uh, collaborative and all these extraordinary things. And, of course, we can change uh, time optically these days by, by time-lapse, uh, time-lapse photography. And, and the reaction of the BBC was because it was you, go at let's go to it? Well, I suppose, you know, track record yeah. counts yeah, Of something. course it does. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so they, I mean, I gave them that kind yeah. of spiel and I've just given you. Yeah, was, it, was it more <laughs> difficult to do than yes. the others? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes. And what was difficult about it other than the fact that... Well, because you do... You do have to have some kind of action. Yeah. You do have to have some right. kind of drama, after right. all. Right. And, and so how did you create that? And you've, well, you've got to be careful in ha not to overdo the time lapse. You know, if everything was in time lapse, it would boil. So, so what it, it's like all things, isn't it? I mean, it is like all good television programs have a plot. They have a, yeah. in which there are characters with, with problems to be solved, and they, in the end, manage to solve it by extraordinary ways. And so what's the most extraordinary thing you discovered in this? <laughs> well, I didn't really I, it For was you. just it was just seeing things. Yeah. The the marvelous thing was that you you put your time lapse cameras in front of a situation of a plant which is doing things, yeah. it's simply growing or developing or that, and you film it in time lapse over maybe one week, two weeks, three weeks, and when you take it to the viewing theater, you have no idea what you're going to see, because no human being has ever seen that before, yeah. ever. Now, if I've been filming lions catching wildebeest, I know yeah. whether the lion caught it or not. Right, I know whether right, you know, right, I take right. it to the theatre. Is it in focus? Yeah. That's what I want to say. Right. 
but with plants, you just don't know. Yeah. Set this up for me, the private life of plants, the germinating seeds of the data. What, what are we going to see? Well, all right, there's an example. Now, a dodder is a parasitic plant. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite common in this country, in the wild, and, and in my country, in northern Europe. Uh, and it, it, because it's parasitic, it doesn't even bother, as it were, to develop leaves. It simply is a tendril, which is going to try and find um, uh, sap and nutriment from other plants. It's, it's a parasite, as humans have parasites. Uh, and this is a sequence in which the seeds of the dodder are germinating near a bed of nettles. Rolled. It's quite amazing. <laughs> it, I mean, I hadn't seen that before. It's done over, you said to me as we were watching, it's over a period of 10 days. Mm. And, and to, just to explain the process a little bit, that you just sat there and... No, we don't sit there no, at no, all. No, but the camera does. Yeah. Um, uh, as you know, uh, film is normally taken 25 right. frames a second and shown at 25 frames a second. If you only take one frame a second and show it at 25 frames a second, it speeds up 25 right. times. Right. So effectively, that's what time-lapse is. And people have been doing that since the beginning of cinema photography. Yeah. But the, the, the ingenious bits, and it's not my ingenuity, it's that of the cameraman, uh, a chap called Tim Shepard, um, is, is that we were able, I said to him, look, I want to have as much freedom to pan and zoom and track and move in and out yeah. in time lapse as yeah. you can in normal time. And that means that if you're going to go up with the dodder uh, as it goes up there, you've got to know how fast the dodder grows, and you've got to, pro you've got to mark, put a, a beam yeah. with a little, a little carriage on it with a camera, which is going to move up at the same speed as the dodder does. Yeah. And each one, each frame is accompanied by a flash, so that while you maintain a night and dark, for uh, the dodder has to have, like any other plant, uh, the oscillation of night and day, uh, throughout, by putting a flash on both day and night, you make it even so that the growth is continuous and the picture is continuous. Yeah. Do you, someone said to me, I wonder if he, under, he appreciated that, and, and you tell me whether you, it, it, this rings a bell at all, how manip manipulative and deceitful and violent plants were. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's in fact what the program is about. I mean, um, uh, deceitful, yeah, deceitful. Um, uh, plants are enormously deceitful. I mean, one of the most engaging deceits of plants is a little... In, Britain has orchids. Everybody thinks orchids grow in tropical rainforests, but, yeah. of course, you know, <laughs> they're little things like that. Yeah. Well, there's an orchid which mimics, which is, mimics a female bee. Its flower is an exact replica, well, not an exact, but a close replica of a, fe yeah. of a female bee. The hair's all right. It's on the head. Even more extraordinary, the flower's perfume is exactly, chemically, the same as the perfume emitted by a female bee when she's looking for a mate. Yeah. And, and the orchid produces this, and the male wasp comes along and says, Wow! Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can see him, he lands on, on the orchid, and he tries to mate. And the vigor with which he makes releases a spring in the top part of the orchid's fur. Yeah. So there's, there's a little hammer. With a, with a yellow blob of pollen that goes doing and hits him on the back of the neck <laughs> with pollen. And you can see the bee going, whoo, whoo, <laughs> whoo, hadn't quite expected that. Yeah. And off he flies and yeah. tries to find another one. So he'd do it all over again, which indeed he tries again. And this time, of course, he's got the pollen on his head. And this time he rubs it off onto another part of the yeah. flower so the orchid is fertilized. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because that you, on, on this program <laughs> uh, last week, uh, Bill Sapphire was here oh, yeah. talking about James Jesus Angleton, okay. you know, who loved orchids. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, yeah. and, and in fact, there was a book written about him called An Orchid for Mother, which was his name. Yeah. Uh, is, is there one, I mean, do you have a particular fascination with any particular plant yourself? Yes, I, I, I uh, am fascinated by a group, a family of plants called the aroids. Uh, the arum lily is, is, is one which we all know. Yeah. It isn't a lily at all. It belongs to this plant, the arum. Uh, the air, and the arums uh, uh, attract um, insects and take them prisoner. I mean, the, the, the arum has a, 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 a sort of a shroud, a spathe, yeah. it's called, or like, like the arum, that white part of the arum lily. And from the, from the top, as you know, in an arum lily, there comes that yellow spadix. Yeah. And that produces a smell which attracts flies. It's not a particularly nice smell. Uh, in, in, in some members of the family, it's a smell of rotting flesh. And the flies go in to try and seek this, and they go through downward-pointing hairs. And at the bottom, inside this tube, there are a lot of small male flowers and a lot of small female flowers. And the female flowers are ripe. Yeah. 
And the flies goes in with lucky, with luck, they've got some pollen from another one. Yeah. And they, and, but they can't get back because of these hairs. So they rummage around trying to get out. In the process, spread the, the pollen on the female stigmas, you see. And then, cleverly, the second night, the male flowers suddenly come out and burst pollen, which scatters all over these flies, you see. They, and at the same, and then, yeah. thirdly, the downward pointing hairs shrivel. Yeah. And the flies say, at last we can get out, and away they go, loaded with pollen. Now I know why, after being a big deal executive at the BBC, you decided to leave all that to go back <laughs> to doing this. Yes. That's a lot of fun. Because, it would, why? Why is it fun? Yeah, no, well, no, why is it fun? But I mean, why did you leave and with all that sort of power and influence you had at the BBC as head I'm of not, programs I'm, and all that role? I'm not so balmy about power. Yeah, didn't? No, I don't think power is particularly attractive. Well, the power to create programs, the power to influence oh, oh, your development yeah. of programs. That's the power, tr that, that is true. The power to, yeah, but, you know, but, see uh, things through. But most people who wield big power, they don't do that sort of thing. They, yeah. they use power to manipulate other people. Yeah. And that had no appeal to you at all? Not particularly, no. Yeah. Uh, to be truthful. I, I mean, I, I started as a zoologist, as a biologist, right. and naturalist, uh, and, and I, the greatest pleasures of my life have come apart from family pleasures mm -hmm. and children and so on, but, but, but they come from the natural world. And, they, and you want to get back to that? Yeah, I, that's what I've been since I left. Yeah. I mean, but it, would, you, it, it just was... You've also said that, that, that you're, you love film much more than writing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. I, I, I find putting words down so that they aren't cliché written. I find writing a good sentence, a very good, a very demanding Satisfying thing. kind of... I don't know about satisfying, it's sort of torturing business. I mean, yeah. I don't but know. having written a good one is a satisfying... Yeah, I suppose that's true. Result. That's true. But film, moulding film, like, like moulding these films, it's just lovely. You know, yeah. It's really lovely. You think, oh, you wonder that shot a little longer or maybe yeah. a little shorter. But you've also said, I mean, what makes you interesting, you've also said you don't particularly like animals. Well, no, well, I actually, I you know said, what you said? I, you, I, well, I said I didn't love animals. Okay, that's right. But you said you didn't said, love them. Someone said, are you an animal lover? I said, no, I, I don't love, love earthworms. Yeah. No, I don't love <laughs> slugs. But slugs Well, how about earthworms. lions and... Well, well, and, yeah. and, and but I mean, they're, magnificent they're creatures. fascinating. That's a point. Yeah. They are fascinating solutions to the problem of being alive and of, yeah. uh, and of reproducing. In other words, you don't want to be their friend. You just want to say... I want to be involved in them. You want to say, look, want to... look, 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 my curiosity wants me to, sh to reflect their uniqueness, their character, their yeah, strength, I mean, their I, it, contribution. Some of the most rewarding experiences of my life um, have been in the wild. Um, I don't want to get too ethereal or pretentious about this, about communication with one, you know, Walden and, yeah, and all I know, that. I know, you know, right. you know. But go ahead. But that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Yeah. The, the, most, the most satisfying experiences have been there. Yeah, have been when you are suddenly aware that, the, that life on Earth isn't just human. Yeah. That life on Earth is infinitely complex, infinitely marvelous, infinitely varied, and a source of deep delight. How do you compare this work with the other pieces, the other series you have done? Uh, I'm almost sorry you, you, you've asked me that because um, uh, it's something one shouldn't really say. Uh, but uh, I think probably this is, this is the best thing which, which I've done. Um, largely because, one, nobody else has done it before, nobody's tried this kind of thing, and, and because a lot of people didn't think you could do it, really. And because most people don't know this the yeah, way they know. I guess. I mean, everybody's seen Lion Hunter right, Will right, right, right. There's a lot of other naturalist films That's that, right. a lot of that type. Mm. This, mm. you know, in, two, in, in books, yes, but on film. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Yeah. What's next? Birds of Paradise. Birds of Paradise. <laughs> yes. Have you already started? Yeah. I've yeah. been what filmed. What will it be? Well, that'll be that. That's a real. You said before, was it? Was a, the BBC offered me a reward? This is a pre, this is a present. This is a little gift from the BBC, really, because birds of paradise are extraordinary. There are over forty different species, utterly different from one another. Some are only small as as robins, and some are big as pheasants. They only live in New Guinea, and there are uh, islands nearby. They have the most extraordinary, fantastic, unimaginably wonderful 
feather plumage, yeah. which they exhibit to one another in dances of the greatest sensual ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> and only four or five have ever been filmed. So there are 30 on there Why? that nobody... <laughs> I'm afraid the answer to that is uh, only too clear. They live in horribly difficult country. Oh, I, I mean, it's yeah. very thick rainforest. It pours yeah. with rain all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's very mountainous. You're clambering up mud and stuff. And they only do it in very, very dark circumstances. Many of them only do it just before dawn. Yeah. And so the light is not good. Yeah, we haven't had camera. We haven't had film that could deal Fast with that. Fast enough to do it. No. Now we've got electronic cameras which can work in those light levels, and I want to be the first to get the guy <laughs> to, be, to get those things in those lights. I've filmed others uh, of the more. Now, had ones. you seen them before you went to film them? Yeah. Well, I ha yes, because I've been going to New Guinea over the past forty years. I've been one well, half a dozen times, or something. So I've seen these wonderful things, and I haven't been able to film them. Much success for this. The uh, Private Life of Plants premieres in two parts: Monday and Tuesday, October 9th and 10th at 8:05 on TBS is also a companion book by Sir David Attenborough, The Private Life of Plants. Thank you very much. Pleasure. We'll be right back. Stay with us.